Good evening. Thank you for joining us here at Christ the Redeemer Anglican Church. Today is July 21st, the eighth Sunday after Trinity Sunday, and we are celebrating the feast of St. Mary Magdalene, which is her feast day is tomorrow. That's really cool. Um, okay, so announcements. Uh, the Kincaids are having a community and parish get-together kind of thing at their house, and the address is now in the bulletin, which it wasn't there last week. There's a sign-up sheet over here by the coffee uh, for... Um, food and beverages, and if you want to bring yard games, bring a yard game, like cornhole or darts. Do we want to have darts? Or whatever. <laughs> Croquet. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, um, but, so, uh, yeah, so uh, sign up sheet for food and, food and beverages, and that's over there. Yes? Not really my type of guy, <laughs> so we're going to plan on having some, but if you want to bring some red meat, AKA steak <laughs> <laughs> or, or whatever you would like, but just throwing that out there. <laughs> Uh, Lectio Divina Group meets Wednesdays at 6.30 at, sh at um, Cheryl's house, except for in August, uh, they will be meeting at Father John's house because Cheryl has debate stuff going on, lots of debate stuff. Uh, ladies Book Study, normally the second Saturday of the month will be the first Saturday in August uh, because of scheduling for Danica for work, and so that is August 3rd will be the next book study, and they are working on Mere Christianity, book four, chapters one through six, I believe, that's what she said. Um, and as always, uh, the Sacrament of Confession, Father John is here early if you want to do that here at 3.30 with Father John in the nursery right there. But I'm sure that if 3.30 on a Sunday isn't a good time for you if you contacted him and made arrangements for another time that would work for him also. Yes. So anything else, Father John? Okay. No. Uh, last thing for our guest, we do have guest cinch bags out there on the um, table. If you want to grab one of those in the blue bag, it has some of our merch. So <laughs> thank you.
Blessed be God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And blessed be his kingdom, now and forever. Amen. Let us pray together. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known. And from you, no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear what our Lord Jesus Christ says. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Upon these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. Kyrie, Kyrie. Kyrie, 
Lord, have mercy upon us, upon us. Christ, have mercy, Christ, have mercy upon us, upon us. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy upon us, upon us. Holy God, holy mighty, holy immortal, have mercy upon us. Glory to God in the highest and peace to his people on earth. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to his people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. You are seated the Father, receive our prayer, for you alone are the Holy One, you alone are the Lord, you alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ. With the Holy Spirit in the glory of God the Father. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Let us pray. Almighty God whose blessed Son restored Mary Magdalene to health of body and mind, and called her to be a witness of his resurrection. Mercifully grant that, by your grace, we may be healed from all our infirmities, and know you in the power of his unending life, who with you and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated for the readings. A reading from the book of Judith. Then Judith fell upon her face and put ashes on her head and uncovered the sackcloth she was wearing. And at the very time when that evening's incense was being offered in the house of God in Jerusalem, Judith cried out to the Lord with a loud voice and said, For your power depends not upon numbers or your might upon men of strength, for you are God of the lowly, helper of the oppressed, upholder of the weak, protector of the forlorn, savior of those without hope. Hear, O oh, hear me, God of my Father, God of the inheritance of Israel, Lord of heaven and earth, creator of the waters, king of all your creation, hear my prayer. Make my deceitful words to be their wound and stripe, for they have planned cruel things against your covenant and against your consecrated house, and against the top of Zion, and against the house possessed by your children, and cause your whole nation and every tribe to know and understand that you are God, the God of all power and might, and that there is no other who protects the people of Israel but you alone. Here ends the reading. Thanks be to God.
Let us stand together and in unison chant our appointed song. As the deer desires the water brooks, so long my soul for you, O God. My soul is a thirst for God, even for the living God. When shall I come to appear before the presence of God? My tears have been my food day and night, while all day they say to me, where is, is your God? When I think upon these things, I pour out my heart. When I remember, I went with the multitude and brought them into the house of God. With the voice of praise and thanksgiving among those who keep holy day. Why are you so full of heaviness, O oh my soul? And why are you so disquieted within me? O oh, put your trust in God, for I will yet give him thanks, who is the help of my countenance and my God. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Please be seated. A reading from the second epistle to the Corinthians. For the love of Christ controls us, because we have concluded this, that one who has died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all, that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, but behold, the new has come. All this from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God is reconciling the world to himself not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to, to God. God. Let us stand for the proclamation of the Holy Gospel. Alleluia, alleluia, give thanks to the risen Lord. Alleluia, alleluia, give praise to his name. Jesus is Lord of all the King of creation. Alleluia, alleluia, give praise to the risen Lord. Alleluia, alleluia, give praise to The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to St. John. Glory to you, Lord Christ. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb, 
And as she wept, she stooped to look into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting there where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing, but she did not know it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Arabic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father, but go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father and to your God, and to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and that he, he had said these things to her. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Give praise to the risen Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Give praise to his name. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Though I do have that in Latin. <laughs> I was toying around with that, so <laughs> maybe next time. <laughs> if you've ever wondered why my email is fatherjohn at redegg.life, um, today, today you'll find out. Uh, it actually has to do with this amazing and devoted uh, saint that we are commemorating today, St. Mary Magdalene. As Louise told us, her feast day is tomorrow, July 22nd. So according to one tradition, after the risen Christ had ascended into heaven, Mary Magdalene went to Rome and had an audience with the Roman emperor, um, Tiberius Caesar. And it was custom for those visiting the emperor to give him a gift. And uh, Mary took an egg. She rebuked Caesar for the crucifixion of Jesus, carried out by his governor of Judea, Pontius Pilate, and she handed him the egg, a symbol of new life, saying, and as she handed it to him, she said, Christ is risen. Caesar replied, how could anyone rise from the dead? It is as impossible as it would be for that egg to ch change from white to red. And according to the story, as he was saying these words, the egg turned blood red. <laughs> Further, according to this tradition, due to the meeting uh, with Mary Magdalene and her criticism of the Roman Empire for crucifying an innocent man, Caesar had Pontius Pilate removed as the governor of Judea and sent to Gaul. This legend of Mary Magdalene and the red collared egg produced wonderful tradition, uh, a wonderful tradition in the, both the uh, Eastern Catholic or Byzantine Catholic and Orthodox churches of painting eggs bright red at Easter time and presenting them as gifts uh, to one another on Easter Sunday. You know, and it's a tradition that persists, persists to this day. And there are also many beautiful icons painted in the Eastern Christian tradition uh, where we see Mary Magdalene holding the red egg. And if you wonder why, that's it. In fact, the one we have out today has her holding the red egg. Um, the Anglican mission that met in my home in um, California was named after St. Mary Magdalene, and hence my email address, okay. red egg. And of course, I've kept that 
because I love the, uh, the uh, ending. I don't know, was it called an extension? I don't know. Red egg dot life kind of says it all, right? <laughs> mm. But to, uh, this, uh, this afternoon, we're going to look at St. Mary Magdalene and see what Scripture reveals concerning, uh, concerning her. So in Luke 8, we learned that St. Mary Magdalene was one of a group of women in the Galilee area who financially provided for Jesus and his disciples. And we also read that Jesus had freed her from seven demons. And we don't know what the bondage, um, we do not know what bondage they placed her in. And we, we don't know how they entered her life. And I'm not going to speculate here how that might have happened. But um, we can safely declare that Jesus freed her from them and the bondage that she was in. And from that moment on, Mary Magdalene became a devoted follower of Jesus all her life. In John 20, we read about the third day after the crucifixion. And we, and we know from all the gospel accounts that Mary Magdalene was uh, present at the foot of the cross. She had witnessed the death of Christ. And she no doubt had been involved in the anointing of his body for the burial in, in the tomb of St. Joseph of Arimathea. I always thought it wasn't very altruistic of St. Joseph to let Jesus have his tomb. He knew he'd get it back in three days. <laughs> Brand new tomb. Here, well, let's put him in there. I'll get it back. <laughs> now John tells us in verse 1 that uh, Mary went early in the morning of the first day of the week to anoint his body again. She left somewhere between 3 a.m. and 6 a.m. To, uh, to walk to the place of his burial and to do this last act of devotion and discipleship for her Lord. And this was, of course, following traditional Jewish custom uh, where people would anoint the body until the third day. Um, it was believed then that uh, the soul departed after the third day. So Mary Magdalene was not doing anything out of, um, out of the norm by going to the tomb. It's worth noting, though, that as, just as throughout the whole Gospel of John, like with the story of St. Nicodemus, um, that Mary begins her journey under the cover of darkness, coming to Jesus, the light of the world, and now unbeknownst to her, risen from the dead. The symbolism of light and darkness is apparent even here at the end of John's gospel, just as it was in the opening chapter. We read that when she arrived at the tomb, the stone had been rolled back and she immediately set off to... Um, to get the disciples. And I find it, it's interesting that in verse 2, she went to St. Peter first. He had denied Jesus three times, and yet his standing is such among the, those who followed Jesus that it is to him that Mary Magdalene goes to report about the uh, stone being rolled away from the tomb. You know, that's a lesson for all of us. Um, about how one fall, even, even a grievous fall, does not destroy someone completely. Jesus is patient with us when we come to him, or rather, when he seeks us out. There is nothing but forgiveness in his gracious arms. He restored Peter. He restores us when we confess our sins and ask for forgiveness. You know, Jesus isn't finished with any of us. He's not finished with us. He knows our frailty. He knows that we are made from dust. So never think that Jesus is through with you. In John 20, 3 through 8, we read how St. Peter and St. John run to the tomb and find it empty. St. John appears, um, peers in, but St. Peter, of course, characteristic of him, rushes right into the tomb. And they find the grave clothes where his body was. And isn't it interesting that in John 11, when Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead, showing that he has power over death itself, that Lazarus comes forth out of the grave and his grave clothes are still on. And he needs help getting the grave clothes removed from his body. But when Christ raises, rises from the dead, his grave clothes remain in the tomb. 
exactly where his body was. Why? Because Lazarus is raised to physical life again, and he would one day die again. <laughs> Christ, however, has defeated death. Death would never have any claim over him again, and so the grave clothes are left behind in the tomb. Lazarus would need the grave clothes again, <laughs> but Jesus will never need grave clothes. In John 20, 10, we read, Then the disciples went back to their homes. <laughs> wow. You might think that, that that's nothing remarkable about those words. But stop and think for a moment, all right? So uh, think about what they've just witnessed. An empty tomb. The grave clothes, which were a few days wrapped around the body of Jesus with the spices, uh, are laying exactly where they had so lovingly lain the body of the Lord. <laughs> and we read, they went back to their homes. <laughs> Maybe they thought, oh, well, what else can we do? Who knows? But now look at what Mary does in verse 11. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb, and as she wept, she stopped to look into the tomb. She remains weeping at the tomb. Her grief and the pain at the loss of her Lord is compounded now by the loss of his body. This was the last place she had seen his broken, dead body, and she won't move from it. The loss of his body is, is the final indignity. Even her grief has been violated, and she weeps. The emotional turmoil of the last, few, uh, last several days overwhelms her, and she breaks down and weeps at the sight of the empty tomb. Yet, despite her grief, she finds the courage to look into the tomb. And wow, what a sight she beholds. Verse 12 says, And she saw two angels in white, sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. Well, the, what a picture John has painted here, right? Jesus had died between two thieves. And now two angels sit on either side of his grave clothes, and he's gone. Mm. And they declare the, his resurrection. They say it. John paints the picture. In verse 13, we read, uh, they ask her a simple question. Woman, why are you crying? From the perspective of heaven, tears at the empty tomb of Christ makes no sense at all. From the perspective of the angels, tears of grief on this first Easter morning are totally inappropriate. You know, that's why by the way, that during the penitential seasons of the church, like Advent and Lent, Sundays are still a feast day. It is inappropriate to weep knowing that Christ is alive on the days, of course, that we celebrate that. I mean, it's okay to weep. <laughs> but in the face of the risen Christ, our sorrows disperse. You know, but for Mary at this point, tears are the only way to express her heart's pain. You know, we, we read her reply, they have taken away my Lord, and I, I don't know where they've laid him. Through tear-stained cheeks and a tear-strained voice, she utters her grief. Whoever they were are now her enemies because they've taken away her Lord from her. So I want to, to say that to learn this simple, simple lesson, anything that takes us away from the presence of the Lord is our enemy. St. Mary says, I do not know where they laid him. And you know, how true, how true for Mary. But the Lord knows exactly where to find her. St. John tells us that, that Mary Magdalene immediately becomes aware of another presence behind her and turning around, um, perceives it to be the gardener. How ironic, right? The first Adam was to be a gardener in Genesis 2.15. We read that. And now the second Adam is mistaken for a gardener. In verse 15, Jesus, um, Jesus now asks her similar questions as the angels. Woman, why are you crying? Why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? 
it's, it's um, theologically interesting that Jesus, the second Adam, calls St. Mary Magdalene woman. We know, all know how the John opens up. John 1.1 1, 1 echoes the very first verse of Genesis 1.1. 1, 1, In the beginning. Genesis speaks of creation. John's gospel speaks of new creation. Genesis tells us of the first man and woman, the husband and his bride, and likewise, so does John's gospel. What does the first Adam say in Genesis 2.23? Then the man said, this, is at last, this at last is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Of course, Mary Magdalene is not the wife of Jesus, right? He had no wife. But if you consider the theological picture that St. John is painting here, you see that just as the first Adam, the man, and his wife Eve, the woman, were in the garden, so the second Adam, also in a garden, is with the woman, Mary Magdalene, who here represents the church, the bride of Christ. That is Christ's bride, the church. It can be said of the same, it could be said the same about the other two women that Jesus calls woman in John's gospel. His own mother and the Samaritan woman at the well. These are historical women who theologically represent the church in John's gospel. The mother of God represents the church who intercedes for the needs of the world, just as Mary interceded at the wedding in Cana when the wine ran out. She also represents the church as the mother of Jesus' disciples. Just as when Jesus was dying on the cross, he gave his mother to be the mother of his disciple, John. The Samaritan woman, who had Israelite lineage mixed with Gentile lineage, represents the church made up of both Jew and Gentile that goes off cheerfully to proclaim the coming of the Messiah, through whom all nations would be blessed, not just Israel. And now, at the end of the story, we have Mary Magdalene, known in the Christian East as the Apostle to the Apostles, being sent by Jesus to tell the Apostles that Jesus has risen from the dead. She indeed represents the church, those of us who have been liberated by the hand of Jesus, sent out by him to tell the whole world that he is alive. Going back to our gospel reading, St. Mary Magdalene is courteous to whoever this man is, even in the midst of her grief, and asks where they have taken Jesus' body so that she may go and bring it back. How ironic. She asks the person who is responsible for the empty tomb. So she's right in that. But she does not recognize him. She has come to the tomb, the place of the dead, looking for a corpse to anoint, and in a moment she will leave having met the living Lord in the place of the dead. <laughs> and death is overturned. And how often we find life in the midst of what we thought was death, only because of the Lord living, the Lord Jesus alive and being with us. Emmanuel, God with us forever. He utters, he utters just one word. Mary, and her eyes are open to who it is who stands before her now. The sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought them all, when he has brought the, all them out, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. Isn't that what John 10, 3 through 4 says? And now it is here in practical uh, demonstration of that truth. He simply calls her by name, Mary. And her shattered soul is transformed and her shattered world is remade. It was her own name spoken by Jesus which opened her eyes to the truth of the resurrection. When Jesus calls his sheep, he always calls us by name. It is always personal with Christ. Mary's response is to fall at his feet. Then comes the gentle rebuke from Christ. In John 20, 17, he says, 
Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Jesus tells her not to cling on to him because he has not yet ascended to the Father. He wants to teach her and the other disciples that he will no longer be known by sight or touch, just as we read in our 2 Corinthians passage. We knew him by the flesh, according to the flesh, but not now. Now we know him by faith, and that is so important because it is only the just, uh, the righteous who are justified by faith. We are justified by faith. This is the beginning of preparing for his ascension, to which he connects with his resurrection. His ascension will be dramatic, so as to leave no doubt in his disciples' mind that he is ascended. And there will be no more earthly appearance of him until he comes again, just as we confess every week in the creed. So what do we do in the meantime? Jesus instructs Mary to go and tell the disciples that she has, what she has seen and heard from her Lord Jesus. She goes immediately to tell them that's what the church is to do in the meantime. Therefore, we should learn from her devotion to Christ, which was driven by her knowledge of what he had freed her from. She knew the reality of life under the powers of darkness and the glorious freedom from which Christ set her free. And it was only in him alone that led her to give up her time and her money to serve Christ. She, she, her gratitude and love for Christ was directly proportionate to her perception of her need. She appreciated her freedom because she knew exactly the, the bo what bondage to demons was like. And maybe the reason why so many Christians live so poor spiritual lives is that we, we've never realized the death from which we have been saved. Today, one of the lessons that we all need to learn from St. Mary Magdalene is gratitude for Christ, for releasing us from sin and death. And maybe that's why our discipleship is actually so superficial. Do we actually know, do we actually realize the depths from which Christ has saved us? Mary did. We also need to learn that when grief and pain in the Christian life comes, and it will inevitably come, then we need to be honest about it. Mary Magdalene cried at the tomb, and she was overwhelmed by the thought of his body being stolen. She did not put on any false face or pretenses. She did not utter word, patronizing words like, oh, it all worked for the good. You know, even though those words are true, um, sometimes... It may not be appropriate to say that in the, someone's deepest sorrow at the moment, right? Though these, right? So standing outside an empty tomb with arms full of spices and a broken heart, Mary others the truest words amid tears. I don't know where they have taken him. I don't know where he is. She didn't know. And sometimes we ask the same question. But Jesus knew exactly where she was. He was behind her. Hmm. Jesus always knows where we are. So she came to the last place she had left him, the tomb, <laughs> the place of no more hope. She returned to the last place that she was in his presence. And she remained there when everyone else had left and gone home. And she was rewarded with the by the resurrected Lord calling her by name, Mary. So dear ones, there are, there are some of you here today who are just like, or perhaps watching, who are like Mary Magdalene. Your heart is breaking, and you can identify with those words, I don't know where he is. Perhaps you've come to church and you're not even sure why you're here or why you're watching, but you know that you had to come because something in your heart and your soul said, this is where I will meet him. And I want to assure you from God's word that um, 
He is here. He is calling your name. He is here in the sacrament of His, his, his body and blood, and He is calling your name. And you'll know He's calling your name because your heart will feel restlessness. In your heart, in your head, there will be a battle going on. A battle for your soul. Your heart is restless because you know everything that you've ever heard about and experienced about bondage or isolation, rejection, failures, death and sin, disappointment. And everything you've ever heard about Jesus applies to you. It is like there's no one else in this church but you and Jesus. And He's calling you by name. Now the response is up to you. Mary fell at His feet in humble adoration. And that's what we have to do too. So finally, there, there's a challenge to all of us as a church today. Christ the Redeemer Anglican Church in the Tri-Cities. Jesus commanded Mary Magdalene to go and tell the disciples that He had risen from the dead and that she had met with her risen Lord. She went and did what she was commanded. As a church, that is a lesson. There is a lesson we need to follow. This is the place where emulating the life of a saint, in this case, St. Mary Magdalene, counts the most. In John 20, 18, we read this. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. How beautiful, how simple. I have seen the Lord. We don't have to be apologetics experts. We say that we have met the risen Christ. We say He has freed us from sin and death. Yet who would know? Who have we told? Isn't it about time that we tell those who we love, those who we know? We need to be like St. Mary Magdalene and go and tell others of the good news. It's good news. If Jesus can perfectly completely and thoroughly set Mary free from seven demons, which is probably what the number seven, the number of completion is getting at, then what can't he do for you? What can't he do for your loved ones, your friends, and your acquaintances? There is nothing that Jesus cannot do. So, <clears throat> St. Mary Magdalene. Let us learn from her devotion to Christ, her honesty in the face of her pain, her searching for Jesus, and follow her example of telling others that he is risen from the dead. This is the way we commemorate and venerate this amazing devoted saint. Now unto God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit with the intercessions and praises of St. Mary Magdalene and all the company of heaven, be all glory, honor, worship, and praise now and forever. Amen. And now let us stand and confess our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, and not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For us, he, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he arose again. In accordance with the scriptures, he ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and His kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, 
who proceeds from the Father, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. And now let us pray for the church and for the world, saying, hear our prayer. For the peace of the whole world and for the well-being and unity of the people of God, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For Stephen, our archbishop, and Jacob, our bishop, for all the clergy and people of our diocese and congregation, and St. Mary's Anglican Church, and Shuibon Su Myanmar, and Kamaragibi Anglican Church Plant in Recife, Brazil. Lord, in your mercy, for all those who proclaim the gospel at home and abroad, and for all who teach and disciple others. Lord, in your mercy, for our brothers and sisters in Christ who are persecuted for their faith, especially those in Nigeria and Pakistan, in China, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For our nation, for those in authority, and for all in public service. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For all those who are in trouble, sorrow, need, sickness, or any other adversity, especially Anderson and Andrew and Alex, Barbara, Brenda and Kathy, Christine, Fran and Gareth, Jenny, Heather, Jay. We pray for Jim and Jonathan and Kay and Katie, Kelly and Kelly, Leah. And we pray for Father Mac. Nevin and Pam and Paul and Rick. Rose, Samantha. We lift up to you Sue and Terry and Terry and Theodore and Trent. Trevor, Will, and a family in need. Lord, in your mercy. For all those who departed this life in the certain hope of the resurrection. In thanksgiving, let us pray. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. What other petitions do we have? Yes, Louise. Is that the Juliet we know? Juliet sent me an email. Price? Yes. So this is her neighbor, friend's neighbor, and then their daughter and her grandchild. So the baby is very, very, very early. Which reminds me, I, I prayed up here, but Trent's not doing well either. I got an email, so. Uh, let's keep let's keep them in our prayers. Yes, Jenny. We've been praying for Jay and his kidney. Right.
Amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. I don't want to put him on my spot, but I'm thankful that my friend Jonathan has arrived up here in the Pacific Northwest. So, <laughs> where's that spotlight? <laughs> Lord, we do give you thanks for friends and family. We give you thanks, Lord, that you have been with Jay this, this, this long time and that he is doing so well. We, we thank you. We give, us, give you your thanks for that. And Lord, now we, um, <clears throat> we also ask, Lord, that you be with... Um, the neighbors of the Prices and specifically their daughter and granddaughter. We ask you to save them both through childbearing, Lord. That you be with the granddaughter, keep her safe, keep her well. Keep her surrounded by your love and your peace. And that you bring this child into the world safely and in good health despite his or her early arrival. Be with them now, Lord. Be with them now and keep them safe. And let your name be glorified. Heavenly Father, grant these our prayers for the sake of Jesus Christ, our only mediator and advocate, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Let us humbly confess our sins to Almighty God. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who in his great mercy has promised the forgiveness of sins to all those who sincerely repent and with true faith turn to him, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and bring you to everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear, hear the word of God to all who truly turn to him. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. God loved the world this way. He sent his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. The peace of the Lord be always with you.
words of our Lord Jesus Christ, who he himself said, it is better to give than to receive. Blessed art thou, Lord. No, that's right. Through the intercession. No. <laughs> By the mystery of the water with this wine, may we come to share in the divinity of Christ, who humbled himself to share in our humanity. Too many prayers in my head. The auditory hymn is the cherubic hymn. We're going to sing um, through the... Um, midway through the second line on the second page, the word cares, and then we will repeat to the beginning and sing to the end. Hopefully. Blessed art thou, Lord God of our fathers, through thy goodness we have this wine to offer, the fruit of the vine and the work of human hands that will become for us the cup of salvation. Present our alms to Almighty God. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, O creatures here below. Praise Him, above ye.
Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. For everything in heaven and on earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head above all. All things come from you, O Lord. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up unto the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is right, our duty and our joy, always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father, almighty creator of heaven and earth, through the great shepherd of your flock, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who after his resurrection sent forth his apostles to preach the gospel and to teach all nations and promised to be with them always, even to the end of the ages. Therefore we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna, Hosanna, in the and gracious Father, in your infinite love you made us for yourself, and when we had sinned against you and become subject to evil and death, you in your mercy sent your only Son, Jesus Christ, into the world for our salvation. By the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, he became flesh and dwelt among us. In obedience to your will, he stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself once for all, that by his suffering and death we might be saved. By his resurrection, he broke the bonds of death, trampling hell and Satan under his feet. As our great high priest, he ascended to your right hand in glory, that we might come with confidence before the throne of grace. On the night that he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it. and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, after supper, Jesus took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in the sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. And we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your word and Holy Spirit 
to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Sanctify us also, that we may worthily receive this holy sacrament and be made one body with him, that he may dwell in us and we in him. In the fullness of time, put all things in subjection under your Christ and bring us with all your saints, among them St. Mary Magdalene, into the joy of your heavenly kingdom, where we shall see our Lord face to face. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit. All honor and glory is yours, almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now as our Savior, Christ, has taught us, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. This day our daily bread. Give us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. It's not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Hallelujah. Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Hallelujah. We do not presume to come to this your table, O merciful Lord trusting in our own righteousness, but in your abundant and great mercies. We are not worthy so much as to gather the crumbs under your table, but you are the same Lord whose character is always to have mercy. Grant us therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of your dear son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood that our sinful bodies may be made clean by his body and our souls washed through his most precious blood and that we may evermore dwell in him and he in us. Amen. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Grant us your peace. Behold the Lamb of God, behold him who takes away the sin of the world. Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. the body of Christ, the bread of heaven. The blood of Christ, the cup of salvation. Come now to the Lord's table. the bread of heaven. Zechariah, the body of Christ, the bread of heaven. Anna, the body of Christ, the bread of heaven. Joseph, the body of Christ, the bread of heaven. Braden, the body of Christ, 
Christ, the bread of heaven. Cheryl, the body of Christ, the bread of heaven. Allison, the body of Christ, the bread of heaven. Abby, the body of Christ, the bread of heaven. Dawn, the body of Christ, the bread of heaven. Jenny, the body of Christ, the bread of heaven.
Oh 
Hallelujah. Hallelujah.